Well, hello, people. Uh, we continue in the afternoon uh, talks. Um, now we are going to have a uh, Lim talking about reproducible and deploy deployable data science with open source Python. How are you, Lim? I'm good. I'm good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, all perfect. Um, where are you streaming from? Uh, I'm streaming from the office, actually. Um, so I went to the office so that I have some private space to this stream. Oh, nice. Nice. Is this uh, your first EuroPython? Yes, this is my first EuroPython. Um, very excited and nervous as well. Yeah, it will go great. Um, well, if you are ready, we're going to share your screen. OK. And uh, we are going to start with it. Good luck. Awesome. Have Cheers. Fun. Can you see the slides? Um, all right. Hi, everyone. Um, very excited to be here today to talk to you about a reproducible and deployable data science with open source Python. Uh, before I continue, I'm just going to check the chat to see if everything is OK. Yes, OK, everyone can see my slides and my screen. That's great. Um, yeah, my name is Lim. I'm a software engineer. Uh, my background is in full stack software engineering. I mostly worked for startups before. Uh, some example companies I have worked with uh, include Deliveroo and Memrise. Right now, I'm working in the data domain at Quantum Black Labs. Uh, Quantum Black is the um, advanced analytics consulting arm of McKinsey. And uh, right now, I'm building data products for uh, data scientists, data engineer, and machine learning engineers to accelerate their projects. I love open source Python. Currently, I'm a core contributor on Kedro, one of the open source tools explored in this talk today. I'm Lim Dotao everywhere on the internet. It means Lim speaker in, in Vietnamese. Um, so the agenda today is I will be setting the scene in which you need to deploy a realistic Jupyter notebook into production. I will explore some of the challenges that you might face in this journey and how you can move from a notebook environment into a standard Python project with uh, Kedro. Then I will explain how we can use Kedro extensibility to integrate with, with other tools in the MLOps uh, ecosystem and a few deployment strategies we can use to deploy the projects as well as uh, how, do, how do we go from here from one project to hundreds of projects in the future. So with that in mind, uh, let's imagine this following scenario. Uh, a media organization wants to provide media and video recommendations to their users. Uh, as we have seen in real life, if done correctly, this can have material impact on the company's bottom line. And this is the organization's first attempt in adopting machine learning and data science in their workflow. So one of their very talented data scientists have conducted extensive research into different algorithms and architectures for building recommendation systems. The data scientist has organized her findings as a series of Jupyter notebooks. Um, and uh, a disclaimer is that all of the notebooks uh, and data science code in this presentation are adapted from Microsoft Recommenders repository, where they details best practices in building recommendation system. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, that's a bad joke, sorry. All right, so uh, when it comes to notebooks, there are a couple of different perspectives. Um, on the one hand, the interactivity, fast feedback loop, and convenience of a Jupyter notebook is almost unbeatable, especially for exploratory data analysis and rapid experimentation. On the other hand, a uh, notebook pose some challenges for uh, reproducibility, maintainability, and operationalization. Specifically, a uh, notebook actually makes it hard to collaborate between uh, each, each other in a team member. I know that there are some recent really cool projects to address this issue, but uh, out of the box, Jupyter Notebook is essentially a single player game. And um, then it also make it, it's also quite hard to conduct code review in a notebook format, as well as some of the other code quality controls that we usually enjoy in software engineering uh, are hard to implement, such as writing unit tests, documentation generation, uh, linting, so on and so forth. And um, notebooks sometimes give you a full sense of security because it cached the results. Uh, when you see your, uh, the, the output cell of your, of your notebook and you see that it has the correct results, it might make you think that your code runs without errors even though the logic has changed. And all of these problems combined uh, cause, I think the biggest issue of them all, which is consistency and reproducibility in your project. So a very in a very interesting study in 2019, uh, New York University executed 860,000 notebooks they found in GitHub, and they found that only 24% of them ran without error, and only 4% of, of them actually produced the same results. 
So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to explore uh, some of the strategies we can use to turn a notebook environment into a standard Python project using Kedro. Uh, disclaimer, I'm a core contributor to Kedro, so this talk will be biased. Uh, so what is Kedro? Um, it is a framework for you to build um, reproducible, uh, maintainable, and mod modular data science uh, by apply software engineering best practices, uh, such as uh, separations of concern and uh, uh, versioning into your code. Uh, it was created by Quantum Black uh, from our own battle scars of delivering a data science project to our client. It's used at startups, major enterprises in academia, um, and it's fully open source. Uh, so, but instead of selling you on this tool um, from the top down, I would like to explore some principles that uh, motivate, uh, motivate us to, uh, to build schedule in the first place and some of the problems that it is trying to solve. So the first problem is data management. Um, data management in Jupyter Notebook has a few challenges. Whenever I come into a new notebook, my, my first instinct was to ask a few questions like, what are the data sets used in, th in this notebook? Where are they stored? How are the data loaded? What are the formats? You know, can I reuse my data loading procedure for other similar data sets? How, I, how can I incorporate, incorporate new data set uh, if necessary? Uh, in, in our example notebook, uh, you could see that it's actually miles ahead of the curve in which it factored out all of the data loading logic into a reusable library for the movie lens data set. But it's not quite ideal because it's programmed directly into uh, the, uh, the specificity of this data set and it's hard to reuse later on. Later on, if you have more data sets, you will have to build more libraries. So the, the way that we solve it in Kedro is we, we, produce, we provide a declarative data management interface uh, through a YAML API uh, as configuration for you. It separates the what, the where, and the how of data loading. Um, and when you stack all of these data sets together, declarative definition of data sets together in a centralized data catalog, it gives you an instant cl cl clarity on which important data sets are used and persisted in your project, even to non-technical team members. Um, it supports a number of uh, features such as interpolation for dynamic values, such as uh, environment variables. Uh, it also supports change, changing data set definitions between different environments, local development, staging production, so on and so forth. So uh, a, a common use case is you would use uh, a smaller data set in local development for rapid iterations and bigger ones in staging and production. Um, it also supports data versioning, partitioning, incremental loading through uh, different data set types and configuration. Uh, it promotes security best practice by accessing data without leaking credential and uh, it's extensible through custom data sets. Um, so you, if you don't, if you find a particular use case that we don't support out of the box, it's very easy for you to write a custom data connector and use it in your, in your project. Um, I think the biggest benefit of declarative data management is it provides a consistent interface between business logic and different IO implementation. So it abstracts away the differences between the different data sources, processing engine, data formats, out of the box, we support many of them. And um, it promotes the reusability of your data connectors as they are separated from your business logic. So you can swap them in and out without changing your data science code. Uh, in, in data science code, um, parameters and configurations are also important. Uh, parameters including the project parameters as well as the hyperparameters of your model. Uh, so in the screenshot here, you could see that um, I have uh, different configurations for different tools that, that I integrate into my project, such as great expectation, which we can see, uh, we'll see in a few minutes, as well as uh, MLflow and, and Spark all in the same place, as well as my parameters are also managed in the same way uh, in, in a YAML file. Uh, the trade-off here is that, um, well, <laughs> Uh, YAML domain-specific language works very well on small and medium-sized projects, but it becomes unruly for massive ones with hundreds of data sets, even with good IDE support. So to, my, to mitigate these problems, Kedro supports splitting your data catalog into multiple YAML files. It also supports changing the templating for, uh, to avoid repeat, repeatability um, at the expense of readability. Uh, and then you can also use some other YAML uh, native features, such as a reusable code block to uh, to improve your uh, configuration. I'm just going to show you a very quick demo of how this looks in real life uh, in our project. 
So this is uh, our data catalog. It's located under conf base catalog.yaml um, in my project. And as, as I mentioned earlier, this is a base environment, but you can also create more environments such as staging and production down here to overwrite uh, your catalog definition in different environments. And um, I really like a feature in VS Code, uh, the outline editor, where you can see the outline of your catalog. So it's very clear what data sets are used in this project. And to demonstrate uh, the idea that we can swap in and out a different um, data set, I'm just going to change this into Spark, Spark data set. I'm going to do file format, uh, CSV, and it will just work the same way uh, with a different processing engine for your code. Um, OK, uh, so this is the. Um, this is the data catalog, uh, and it hopes that it gives you some idea on how it can help you with data management in uh, Jupyter Notebook. And the next bit is about how do you manage the code in your project. So the challenges with managing code in Jupyter Notebook is that um, cells need to be run in a specific order. There are global scope variables that may or may not have been initialized. Uh, it's hard to unit test specific cells in its isolation. It's still necessary to factor our common logic into pattern utilities outside of notebook to prevent the notebook from becoming polluted. So um, out of the box, schedule gives you a few simple but uh, powerful coding patterns as well as abstractions to help you manage the code better in uh, in a project. The, the first thing is that um, business logic in schedule are written as pure Python functions. But that means there are a lot of benefits to this, but the one of the biggest one is you can unit test it in isolation, and then you can use other tools in the Python ecosystem when it comes to functions such as decorator composition uh, to help you write uh, more modular code. And then these pure Python function um, can be connected together to use in a bigger pipeline in a concept that we call a node. And a node is just a thin wrapper around these functions uh, with, um, with inputs and outputs which are dynamically injected at runtime by the declarative data sets and catalogs that you uh, that you have seen earlier. So um, the pipeline shapes is always a DAC, which is a directed acyclic graph by design. So there's no cycle in your data flow. And um, algebraically speaking, it's just a set of node. So they can be concatenated together to form bigger pipelines. In this, this, in this example, you could see that I have three nodes in my data processing pipeline to clean my racing data and movies data and um, uh, use the outputs of these two nodes at the input of my uh, create model input table node. And this is my data science, sorry, data processing pipeline. And then I could create my data science pipeline the same way. And then in the end, I just concatenate them together because in the end of the day, it's a set of nodes. So uh, it's, um, it, has, uh, it's, it has algebraic uh, properties. And you can build pretty big pipelines this way, um, iteratively and modularly. So this is uh, an, a demo that we have online. But I would also like to show you uh, the an example article that one of our users um, actually wrote on Mediums. And just want to show you the screenshot of, uh, of their pipeline, which I think is quite massive. Uh, it is at the end, yeah. So this is. Uh, a pipeline that um, this company runs in production. It's one of the biggest uh, telecom company in, in Indonesia, I think. Um, one thing worth pointing out about the coding patterns in, in Kedro is that um, the topology of your pipeline is that dictated by the data flow. As we saw before, you need to connect the node using the inputs and outputs. So inherently, a Kedro pipeline is data-centric. It's a DAG of data. If you are familiar with other workflow engine, um, such as uh, Airflow, Prefect, a pipeline is a deck of tasks and data artifacts. Uh, so in, in a way, in schedule, you all already have a table level secondary lineage of your data for free. And the transformation logic that produces it uh, is it's not column level lineage, but it's a good start. Um, so that's the coding patterns that can help you uh, extract the code from Jupyter Notebook and then put into a Python uh, project in a uh, maintainable way. And the next big thing that I want to talk about is the development experience in Kedro, because as we know, the development experience in Jupyter Notebook is amazing, especially when it comes to uh, exploratory data analysis and rapid experimentation. It also has really, really great communicative utility, right? Uh, for example, I come into this um, 
algorithm recommendation system algorithm notebook and then i could understand very easily what's going on so i think i think this is a great strength of notebook that we try to match uh, with the tooling that we provide in kettle so the first thing is we provide interop interoperability with jupyter notebook for exploratory data analysis by allowing you to use schedule constructs inside the notebook for example uh, you can use the data catalog to load and save your data uh, within the notebook itself uh, before you move on to writing code in, in an IDE. We also allow you to embed a pipeline visualiz visualization within a notebook. So then you can visualize the shape of your data flow when you explore your data. But beyond the notebook environment, uh, we provide a very powerful CLI uh, environment uh, to help you run uh, your project iteratively. Um, there's a run command here that support running the whole pipeline, running the pipeline in different environment, running a uh, different sub pipeline within the main pipeline, running a single node, uh, overriding uh, parameters at runtime so that you can, for example, here, uh, I want to, to try different uh, hyperparameter for my uh, uh, for my model. So I can run my pipeline uh, many times with different parameters just to see how it works. And uh, there's a long list of run commands. Most of them are powered by the fact that uh, our pipeline is just a set of nodes, so you can filter it in, in any which way that you like. Beyond our provided command, uh, we also allow people to um, to provide their own CLI commands either through a set of plugins. Uh, for example, the visualization tools that you saw earlier is built as a plugin and provided as a command in Kedro. You will also see uh, another plugin later, which is Airflow, where um, we will create an Airflow DAP from, uh, from the Kedro pipeline. And finally, you can also uh, create your own commands in, within your project, um, as you can see down here, where you create your own run command within the CLI.py in your project. So it's a very extensible way to uh, to add more to your development experience uh, in, in Kedro. And here are some of the example CLI extensions by built by our community. Uh, there is a Kedro MLflow plugin to provide commands to interact with MLflow. Uh, there's a Kedro diff plugin, which is really cool, where it shows you the, the diff of your pipeline between different um, Git branches. Another, another tool that come out of the box with Kedro is uh, a powerful pipeline visualization with uh, Kedro with its plugin. Uh, it helps you develop and communicate your pipeline with fast feedback loop. So in my example here, uh, when I change my pipeline definition, uh, the, the visualization to uh, what listens for the changes in the file and then automatically refresh itself. So you could actually see that your, your pipeline shape actually has changed. And it's also being actively worked on to turn into uh, an interactive data science IDE, even though uh, my product manager might kill me when I say this, but uh, stay tuned. Um, then the last thing is um, Kedro allows you to scaffold your new projects with standardized project template. It's originally based on cookie, data science, cookie cutter data science. And it comes with um, a few tools out of the box, such as linting with Flickit, um, and iSort, code formatting with Blake, so on and so forth. It supports more advanced setups, such as Spark initialization through a concept of starters. And it supports custom starters to tailor to your project need, such as um, a specific CI CD configuration. All right, so that's that's it about uh, Kedro. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about how you can use Kedro to integrate with other tools in the MLOps uh, ecosystem. If you think about MLOps, there are many different ways people describe it these days, but one of my favorite one comes from NVIDIA, where they model MLOps at the life cycle. And as you could see, Kedro helps you with the collaboration development workflow in the middle. And then it provides some tools out of the box to help you with data collection, data ingestion, and data analysis. But what about all of the other um, net, uh, responsibilities in the ML life cycle? And instead of trying to become like an one size fit all kind of tools, Kedro provide a very extensive um, integration mechanism for you to hook into uh, these different needs in a pipeline life cycle. For example, how do I run data quality checking after my raw upstream data is loaded? How do I emit runtime metrics so after a node runs so that I can set up a monitoring system, so on and so forth. Uh, it provides its extensibility mechanism through a concept of hooks, life cycle hooks, that map exactly to the MLOp life cycle that you saw before. Um, and 
We have seen it used to integrate Kettle with uh, different tools like Grafana and Prometheus monitoring, MLflow experimentation tracking, so on and so forth. In our example today, we will look at how we can automate uh, data quality checking with great expectation using Kettle hooks. Uh, great expectation is a Python-based open source library for validating, documenting, and profiling your data. And the way we do it is that we are going to write a, a hook uh, after before we save our data set to validate the data so that uh, if there is some changes in the data with bad qualities, we want to stop it from propagating down the pipeline. Uh, I'm going to show you a live demo of this uh, very quickly. So um, this is the code editor. This is my data catalog, as we saw earlier. In Kedro, you can provide these hooks in a file in your project called hooks.py. So this is my hooks.py file. And then this is my data validation hook using great expectation. When I initialize it, I initialize the data context in great expectation using the configurations that are um, uh, located in, um, in conf base. And this is the hook implementations. Uh, this uses the same hook mechanism as PyTest uses. In fact, it's powered by the plug, the library that PyTest people made for uh, building plugin architecture. Um, so this is this hook is called before data set saved, and um, the idea is very simple. Uh, when before you save a data set, you try to get an expectation suit, which is like a set of validations to run against this data set. If there is a suit that matches the data set name, then we will just run it using great expectation. I have configured my project to have uh, one expectation suit to match my clean movie data set. Um, this is a JSON file, but it also has a Jupyter notebook interface for you to interact with it, um, provided by great expectation. And when I run my pipeline, um, let me just do this quickly. This hook will be called automatically. Um, and you will see that after after the validation runs, we can open what uh, we call a, a data docs uh, for you to view the pipeline, sorry, to view the validation results. Um, actually, because I changed my data catalog earlier and has some typo in it, I'm going to change it back to pandas. Um, data set. I'm going to run this again. Um, uh, I think that should work. Yes, uh, the data the data doc is located under uncommitted data docs, and there's an index.html here. I'm going to um, open. Okay, I'm going to open with my this with my um, browser. Just a second. And this is a great expectation data docs where you can see uh, all of the previous runs of my, of my pipeline and all of, the, all of the validations come from those runs. And if you click and click on one of them, you will see like what expectations were run. And then if it fails, then it will tell you why it failed. Um, so that is how um, you can use schedule extensibility to add uh, automated validation checking into your pipeline quite easily with just a few lines of code. Uh, the last, um, another bit I want to talk about is after all of this development effort, as well as putting uh, controls in place to assure that your coding quality, as well as your data quality, are pristine. Now we need to think about deployment. How do we deploy this pipeline into productions? So to this end, um, get your support of your deployment strategies. If your project fits, if your pipeline can run into a single machine, uh, we support a single machine deployment mode where you can just containerize it using Docker or package it as a will file and then install it in your uh, Python environment in production and then just run it as any Python package. But it also supports a distribu distributed um, deployment mode. Uh, if your pipeline cannot run on a single machine, then you will need to split it up and then run it on different nodes in a cluster. And I will demonstrate how it looks today uh, using that principle uh, with uh, Apache Airflow. So the idea is very simple. This is convert every node in your pipeline into uh, into an airflow task and then the whole pipe, sorry, into an airflow app and the whole pipeline, each node is converted into a task. Um, as you could see in the screenshot here, uh, my my task flow in, in Kedro look exactly the same as my uh, task flow in my airflow app. Um, if there's time, I will show you a, a live demo of this in a bit. But a very good question to ask is like, 
why starting with schedule and then having to convert this into airflow later on if they look exactly the same? So as we saw earlier, starting with schedule gives you the benefits of rapid de development, uh, much closer to that of Jupyter Notebook. It focuses on data flow, not task flow, and it gives you the flexibility to stay simple. So if single machine deployment works for you, uh, let's do it before you have to go distributed. It gives you the flexibility to choose between between different distributed orchestrators. So you, if you don't have Airflow, you can go with Argos, Qflow, Prefect, uh, whatever. The principle is the same. You convert parts of your pipeline into the, uh, the primitive construct in the orchestrator environment, and then uh, off you go. And then there's a very powerful concept here that I would like to, um, to promote, and that is your deploy pipeline doesn't need to have the same granularity as your development pipeline. So in development, we, we want we want as much details as we want uh, as we can to yeah for all of all different purposes. Um, but in in production, sometimes we are constrained mostly by the computing resources as well as the production environment. So we might want a different way to to, to slice the pipeline and then deploy it based on those constraints. So in in exact in this example here and. Um, I have split my pipeline into just two different tasks in my Airflow DAC. One do data processing, and one uh, one does model training. And theoretically speaking, um, with Airflow, you can run these two different um, two different tasks in two different workers. Uh, and one might support Spark, and the other might use GPU if you use uh, deep learning models. And the last thing I want to talk about is um, beyond how do we go beyond a single project? How does these tools help you to scale from one project to hundreds of projects? And um, basically, it, it helps you do that by uh, promoting the concept of reusability. So you can reuse your pipelines between projects using a an abstraction that we call modular pipelines. I didn't have time to cover this today, but it's in our documentation. It helps you build reusable data connectors, reusable extension hooks. So beyond just great expectation, uh, you can build other hooks, as I mentioned before, to do um, performance monitoring uh, or um, experimentation tracking. It help you. It help you build reusable CLI commands. Help you create scaf scaffolding templates with starters, uh, and you can also publish them as open source libraries for other uh, for the community to use too. Um, and that is it for my presentation today. Um, all of the code uh, for this project is hosted uh, in this repository. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. It was uh, really nice and um, well done. So now we have uh, two minutes left. Um, if you want, we can do a bunch of questions that you have. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. So the first question is, does Schedule support pipeline versioning? If yes, how do you track dependencies? OK, so um, as mentioned before, pipeline is constructed as pure code. So you can check it into version control. Um, you would version control your pipeline exactly as you version control Python code, uh, maybe Git, or if you have other version control system like Mercurial. And then dependencies are also, I, I suppose you meant you talk about um, project dependency, not dependency between pipeline. Um, in terms of project dependencies, it's tracked, again, as any other Python projects with um, your um, standard tooling, such as requirement files, or if you use, well, we use a requirements.txt and, and bit uh, generally, but I think you can also use poetry if, you are, if you're advanced or um, more trendy. Yeah. Um, and the next one uh, says, what do you think are the main pros and cons of Kedro with respect to DVC? Yeah, so I think um, that's a great question. I'm not that familiar with DVC to, um, to to talk about this. But what I think Kedro helps is it helps with the development workflow. Uh, it helps with collaboration. It helps standardize your practice across your organization so every team uses the same standards so that it's easy to transfer between projects or it's easy to reuse a code later on. Whereas DVC, in my limited understanding, is specifically concerning uh, version control of your data and your code. And I think these two tools are complementary, like they are orthogonal, in my opinion. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lim. It was really good for the first time. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, 
The time is limited, so if people have more questions, please go to the breakout room parrot and uh, Lim, you will be there answering questions they have. Thank you. Uh, right. Thank you so much.